Hello, everyone. I'm Jeremiah. This is my colleague, Lev. We're here from Google to discuss Berberis, a binary translator for running RISC-V apps on x86 Android. We're going to start out with some high-level information about what the project is, current state of things, how you can use it today, and then we'll get into some more technical information about the architecture and how it works, and we'll close out with a look at some of our uh, future plans. So Berberis is another word for Barbary. Uh, pictured here is a Berberis caramel hard candy that's popular in Eastern Europe. Lev brought some of those with him today, so if you'd like to try it, find him afterward. More technically, Berberis is a way for us to run Android apps that contain native RISC-V code on an x86 system. We do that by only translating the user space code inside of the app, so RISC-V U mode, while the kernel, system services, and Android runtime are all built for x86. And because they're built for x86 and running on x86, we can leverage hardware virtualization to get native or near native performance out of 99% of the operating system while we just focus on that last 1%. Uh, this is significant because it enables app developers to build and test their apps without necessarily having access to RISC-V hardware that's capable of running Android or having a workstation powerful enough to do whole system Android uh, emulation. We currently support the RV64G ISA along with the compressed uh, instruction and vector instruction and bit manipulation instruction extensions, along with some other ones that are either uh, planned or in progress. We support all NDK libraries other than Vulkan right now, so that's lib Android, lib EGL, things like that. And with that, you're able to run Android APK files that contain shared libraries that are built for RISC-V uh, and make managed to native calls, so calling from your Java side to your native side and going the other way from native to managed code through JNI and something called uh, the native bridge, which we'll talk about. And if your app crashes, both the crash report and the logcat output will include uh, a backtrace of the RISC-V code that was running at the time, along with uh, RISC-V register values, things like that. So Android uses something called CTS, or Compatibility Test Suite, to self-test. Some of those tests contain native code. Uh, if you run those native code carrying tests under Berberis, you get a pass rate of over 99%. Uh, that's things like Bionic, which is the Android libc implementation, and all of those other NDK libraries. Uh, going a step beyond that, we've actually validated multiple first party apps. We built them for Risk v and tested them under Berberis and found that Maps, YouTube Music, Play Store, uh, a couple of other apps are working and actually quite performant. If you'd like to use Berberis today, you can. It's developed in the open as part of AOSP. Uh, the link here will take you to the readme file in our repository where you can find instructions about building and using Berberis. We currently don't provide pre-built images. You have to build it locally to use it. Uh, but if you do, Android Studio now has provisional support for building and running, uh, or building rather, RISC-V APKs. So if you have Berberis running, you can, uh, Android Studio will pick that up through ADB and you can actually do the build and run one click uh, deployment that folks are used to within the IDE. And now Lev will get into some more information about the architecture. Hi, so uh, I'm Lev. Uh, my team have, has been working on binary translation framework for Android for more than 10 years now, not in context of RIS-5, but uh, for more than a year, we are now bringing up this Berberis project, which is specific to RISC V. And I'm going to give you some architecture overview of uh, what design decision we have taken and why we think they were right. Oh, so the other way. Right. So first, as Jeremiah has pointed out already, uh, we try to reduce the overhead of translation as much as possible. So on this diagram, only orange boxes are affected of, by, uh, by the translation. We only operate in user space, means that kernel runs natively, as x86 executable. All system services are native. Uh, Java VM is native, and only parts of the app are being translated. And not the Java part of the app, but only the native libraries that are um, app is sh shipped with. Like, uh, if you bring up some RIS-5 libraries with your app, we'll translate them and connect, connect with the rest of the system. The other way. So what are main components of the translator? We usually think of it as a four pillars. 
Uh, first two is classical approach to binary translation uh, that everyone utilizes. We need to emulate individual instructions like arithmetic, uh, branches, uh, but also more complex instructions like atomics. Uh, we need to proxy syscalls from guest to host. Uh, we also were challenged by vectors implementation, like many other emulators that I have heard of during the summit, but uh, this, this is something that everybody does and we had to do as well. Uh, but if you emulate individual instructions, it's, it's very slow, um, it, it not practically usable, so you also need to do what is called optimizing binary translation, or you can think of it as a jitting. Uh, you take a trace of incoming RIS-5 instructions, you convert them to the corresponding trace of host, or in our case, x86 instructions, and you memorize the result and reuse it every time, and that makes things like many times or like two orders of magnitudes faster. Uh, but in Android world, these two pillars is not enough. Um, due to the design I showed on the previous slide, we have, um, uh, operating system primitives such as thread and signals that coexist between host and guest worlds simultaneously. So we have x86 and RIS-5 threads uh, that we need to remember state for simultaneously, and this is something that we need to work on and correctly implement. B but also, uh, we need to correctly uh, provide the API to the guest libraries. Uh, and let's me go to the next slide. Uh, so on the left, you see the app that is running in this guest universe, so to say, and the, on the right, everything is host. So whenever app is loaded um, as a Java application, when it wants to make a call to the guest side, we need to properly involve the translator and um, make this calls run smoothly. But when the translated code is running, it may call back to Java, and this is the second uh, API surface we have to proxy. The third one is actually making the app able to call native libraries. It's the third one. Uh, we, there are more than 40 public libraries that Android offers to app, and all of that has to be properly simulated. And the last one is, uh, making sure that whenever app is making syscalls, we call the corresponding syscalls and all the arguments and results are properly proxied forth and back. All right, then, uh, now I'm gonna say a few interesting uh, facts about how we approached ISA translation. Uh, so obviously RIS-5 and uh, x86 are very different and some of the differences are listed on this slide. First is that uh, x86 basically has twi twice less registers, and that has serious conse consequences for uh, making the translation performant. You, you cannot simply map the registers, you have to store these five registers in memory. That results in like quite a bit of overhead that we have to try to optimize and work around of. Uh, also, x86 is Complex instruction set, it means that we have to analyze sequences of freeze instructions and try to fold them into shorter, uh, shorter but more complex instructions. Um, there is differences how integers are extended by default, whether it's signed or unsigned. Uh, we have to properly emulate rounding modes of RIS-5 that do not exist on, on Intel. We have to emulate FP boxing. Uh, and we also have to software emulate memory reservation because Intel doesn't have any hardware that would provide similar uh, functionality for atomics. <coughs> uh, and the last but not least is uh, uh, vector emulation. Like many of you should know that like the approach is, that is taken for vectors uh, for RIS-5 allows dynamic configuration of vector sizes, and that doesn't really map to classical AVX or SSC that Intel normally uses, and that imposes great challenges for us to, to emulate it efficiently, like we cannot like, map one instruction to another, and right now we only have pretty slow uh, interpretation emulation of vector, and this is something that we want to improve in future. 
And the last slide I'm covering in this uh, talk is our optimizer. So uh, to show you an example, on the left you can see some input RIS-5 code. It's a hypothetical uh, hotspot. It's a loop uh, requiring computing something. Um, we have several gears of translation, like interpreter is not interesting, it's too slow, we only use it for debugging, but we have a light translator to warm up um, without high translation overhead, and more optimizing what we call heavy optimizer. So in the middle you see what we call the light translator, it didn't do many optimization, it basically applied some template translation. Uh, if you see there are three basic blocks, the middle one is pretty long. Um, because it contains like different instrumentation that we applied. Uh, and uh, the rightmost box contains the optimized version of the same. Now you see the middle basic block one is twice shorter and it's loop body so like it, it's significant performance improvement and the main thing that we have done is we moved all this memory accesses needed to read and store um, RIS-5 registers we moved them out of the loop and that and we applied a few more optimizations that made the whole thing much shorter and nicer uh, and with that i'm giving it back to Jeremiah. okay so in conclusion one of the key takeaways we want people to have from this is that berberus is extensible we mean that both in terms of cpu emulation and api emulation you could retarget Berberus for something other than uh, RISC-V as a guest architecture, for something other than x86 as a host architecture. Or let's say that one of the three modes of translation that we've implemented isn't sufficient, you could even implement a different one. Uh, likewise, API emulation is also intended to be extensible. So you could use Berberus to build your own tailored binary translation solutions uh, focused around Android uh, as, as needed. Looking forward, we're currently going full steam ahead on implementing support for ARM hosts so that developers using something like an Apple Silicon device, for example, will have access to the same level of performance as developers using Intel devices. Uh, once the Android NDK ABI for RISC-V and the set of, set of extensions included in that has been finalized, we'll need to implement those. Uh, as Lev mentioned, our vector performance is not great right now. It doesn't leverage any of the host architectures uh, vector SMD extensions, so that's something we'll need to look into. Uh, we also need to implement support for Vulkan, and then from there we can start to talk about full Android CTS compliance and shipping pre-built emulator images that you can just download and use directly within Android Studio. And finally, I want to leave everyone with this link for slides, uh, or this slide for links, rather. Uh, there's a public mailing list that you can sign up for. Well, everyone's welcome. We'll be sharing feature announcements there as we implement new things and uh, we'll be monitoring it for questions or feedback that folks might have, both of which are greatly welcomed. All right, thank you all. I think uh, we're ready for questions. So I've got a quick question. So how do you compare uh, Barbaros to only, the, I mean, only the uh, instruction uh, translation part to what's done in QMU? Do you have like, uh, you first, convert uh, RISC five to some uh, IR and then recompile that to x86 or you've done it directly? I can take this one. Uh, so as I said, we have two gears, light and heavy. Light does it directly and heavy has internal representation that we can optimize upon. So yeah, in short, we have two, two modes and both are possible. Not at the moment, no. Maybe, maybe to add on to that, because we do have some time, uh, we are currently working on a RISC-V backend so that people could tr potentially translate to RISC-V, but we don't have any plans to do the x86 to RISC-V at, at this time. D did you mean to say ARM backend? No, the RISC-V backend for running on RISC-V uh, target devices. Oh, yeah. yeah. So now that there's RISC-V laptops and things like that, development systems you can use that kind of would natively fit a lot of that, right? 
To an extent, yes. Um, I think one of the main issues that we're concerned with is like the scale and the number of app developers that we have building things for Android who may not be able to buy RISC-V devices. Um, the other thing is you would need, uh, you need support for good hypervisor, right, in order to get that same level of performance running RISC-V Android on a RISC-V, say, Linux workstation. Yeah, I have a question about uh, you have mapping the RISC five the atomic uh, a lot of reserve stock condition to the x eighty six the atomic such as the compare exchange. So, uh, w w how do you uh, uh, what uh, can you share the details about that? How to you how do you implement with that? Because QMU backend such as the RISC five to x eighty six have the such problem. So, 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 sorry, are you talking about uh, like uh, memory reservation or like single atomic arithmetic set, for example? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, you have mentioned in your slide that you have mapping the RIX-5 load reserve and stock yeah, condition uh, to the x compare exchange, right? Yeah, to emulate this memory reservation, we basically have to maintain a, a table with locked addresses in software, and it's pretty slow. So uh, it's fully software emulation because, like, th there is not hardware analog on Intel. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah, I think we're good. Thank you all. Thanks.